Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our interview with Norman Finkelstein. So please join us again. Hi, Norman. Hi. I, I want to just, in, in, in uh, deference to my past, I have to. Uh, well, let me set it up first. Cause oh. <laughs> first of all, you've got to watch the earlier segments because the, the story Norman's going to tell is not going to make any sense if you don't. But, he's go but for a while, as Norman said he was a Maoist, and, and before we move on, he's going to, he's got a story he's just got to get out. Well, first of all, I want to show that my memory hasn't gotten that bad. It was Yao Wenyuan, Wang Kongwen, Zhang Xiong Zhao, and Zhang Jing. Those were the gang of four. Because in the previous segment, Norman only got three of the four, so he's, he's, <laughs> yeah. he figured out I the fourth have, here. I would have lost Final Jeopardy, so <laughs> I want to show I do remember that. Right. Uh, the story was when I was I had a high school sweetheart. Her name was Maxine. She's actually an Israeli now. Uh, she moved there 30 years ago. We fight like cats and dogs, but old friends. And once we were walking along the beach in uh, Rockaway, and I'm trying to convert her. I said, Maxine, now you agree one plus one equal two. She said, of course, one plus one equals two. She was very good at math, by the way, much better than me. And I said, so then why can't you accept that when the forces of production come into contradiction with the relations of production, we have socialist revolution? <laughs> I remember her looking not convinced by that brilliant argument. But that was my level of argumentation and my uh, level of fanaticism. Even one plus one equals two, is it right? <laughs> well, even that. Um, I wasn't that level of sophistication in math yet. So let, let's move on. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about your disillusionment with Maoism. Mm -hmm. um, your, your whole identity is kind of, you know, comes crashing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so you start to move on. You when does Israel-Palestine become no, such a central true. issue no. for you? First of all, it was not on my radar at all. You know, people say, oh, I'm obs nowadays people say that I'm obsessed with Israel-Palestine. Actually, I had no interest in it at all. I was involved in the anti-war movement, so struggles in Central America, civil rights, things like that. Uh, Israel-Palestine doesn't uh, come on my radar until the day Israel invades Lebanon in June 1982. I was involved in a small group of uh, Meshuggah Jews uh, called JMO, Jews Against the Israeli Massacre in Lebanon. I'd like to say that after Sabra and Shatila, that was probably the second biggest disaster of the war, our little group. Um, and the, we had to have what were called principles of unity. That's how you form it. Explain that. What does that mean, the second biggest disaster? Oh, Sabra and Shatila was the big massacre. No, I know what that was. Oh, our group, because we were all crazy. We were Meshuggah Jews. Because at that point, you have to remember, this is 1982, no normal person was criticizing Israel. It's true. You had to be a little bit crazy. Uh, the only one who had sort of like intellectual distinction, the two people who had intellectual distinction and were identified with criticism of Israel, the two people were Professor Chomsky and Edward Said. But the rank and file were slightly off. I mean, a lot of loose screws upstairs in our little group. Uh, now, of course, they would say, including yourself, <laughs> maybe. That's for others to judge. Um, but our, one of the issues that came up was, are you a Zionist or not? And everybody's anti-Zionist. And I was not going there because I had my share of with ideologies. I wasn't going to go along with it until I knew what I was talking about. And the point here is, do you accept there should be a state of Israel or not? Well, at that time, to be an anti-Zionist meant that you don't support the state of Israel. That's correct. And we had to achieve principles of unity for our group. And it was perfectly obvious that if you deny Israel's existence, you are confined to a sect or a cult. Well, you, there, can, you, you, there you, was you, you no deliberately way. missed a word here, right to exist. A lot of people, I mean, Hamas doesn't deny Israel mm. exists, but mm. some people in Hamas deny its right to exist. Uh, we, can get, we, we can get to that later. At the time, their question was, 
are you going to recognize Israel? Okay. Because if you don't recognize Israel, then you've lost 99.9% .9 of the Jewish community. Then what's the whole point of form forming Jews against the Israeli massacre in Lebanon? We come to 10, 10 Jews. And as you correctly stated, that was interrelated with where you stood on Zionism, or as that's how it was understood. And I wasn't going to go along until I did significant research. I wanted to understand. Now it was no longer just looking for arguments to support my cause. I wanted to be careful what I'm, uh, what I'm wetting myself to before I did it. And I sat down and I started to read on Zionism. And after about a couple of years, I decided, well, what the heck, maybe I'll turn it into my doctoral dissertation because I, uh, I was one of those ABDs. How old are you at this time? Uh, okay, 1982, so I'm 29. Um, I, was, uh, I, I was one of those ABDs, all but dissertation, because I was going to write my dissertation on the transition to socialism, and then the whole thing collapses. I'm finished with transitions. I'm finished with academia. I worked in the after-school program with kids. Um, but then I figured, all right, let's turn this into my doctoral dissertation. And that's when I uh, got very much involved. And uh, in the, in, it is an intellectual uh, object. And so now you had, it was a political, I was politically involved after the June 82 war. With my dissertation, I was intellectually involved. And the fact that I was Jewish, of course, meant there was now a personal element also to it, obviously being Jewish and where you stand on Israel. So everything sort of now came together, my political interest, my intellectual interest, and my family interest, because the Holocaust obviously back then was being used even more so than today uh, as a weapon to justify Israel's uh, uh, denial of Palestinian rights and its criminal policies. Uh, so everything now came together. Uh, but still, the, the fact of the matter was, if you ask why I'm still at it, today, 32 years later, uh, the answer is not because I'm obsessed. The answer is because it's not been resolved. Had it been resolved, I would have moved on. But I could never in my own mind or heart, I could never justify moving on because I'm bored. But you, you know, didn't... my closest friend in the occupied territories, Musa Abu Heshesh, He's the field representative in the Hebron district for Beth Selim. If I ever told him, I'm bored already with Palestine, I'm moving on, you know, I could never look at him again. What do you mean you're moving on? I can't move on, meaning him. So what do you mean you're moving on? And it was also, you know, what I got from my parents, that faithfulness. You don't abandon the cause because you're bored. That's not a, a justification. So I stuck to it, I, faithfulness. But you didn't just stick to it. You mm -hmm. stuck your neck out. You lost positions in universities. You mm -hmm. got, I mean, when you came in here, one of our colleagues here said, you know, you're one of the most hated people. Mm -hmm. Do you have a bodyguard? Mm -hmm. I mean, you suffered a lot of slings and arrows. I, I would say I endured slings, slings and arrows. I would never use the word suffering. I know suffering. Uh, the other day I was in Geneva and I was asked to give a little speech on behalf of a family, uh, four of whom their children are in jail, the Esawi family. Uh, Samir Esawi, he was on a 266-day hunger strike. Uh, Shireen, who I gave the uh, speech on behalf of, she won the Alkana Human Rights Award, uh, she's been in jail. When I came back, the son was in jail. And I met the parents. The parents came to pick up the award. Both of them had been in jail. And they put on a very strong face, a very strong face. But then I saw the mother hug one of the Swiss legislators who has been campaigning on behalf of her family. And you saw her just collapse. Then at the airport, I escorted them. We were both traveling through Istanbul. I 
I teach in Turkey, and they were going via Istanbul to Ben Gurion Airport. Uh, I escorted them, and when we were about to depart, the mother, who, as I said, puts on a very strong face, she just broke into tears. Uh, that's suffering. Oh, I didn't mention one of the sons was killed. So one son was killed. Currently, four children are in jail. That's suffering. You know, I'm past 60. I'm in good health. I have a roof over my head. I have food on my table. But there, you can't call that were there, suffering. Were there not moments where you wondered, why do I keep doing this? Yeah, I'm not sure if everyone knows your story. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's pretty easy to go to Wikipedia mm -hmm. and get all the detail. Uh, but, but you were ostracized, uh, certain, mm -hmm. not just by the Jewish community, mm -hmm. by academia, by, I mean, you were not out there on your own, but you were to a large extent out there on your own. And you didn't flinch. No, there was never, uh, there was never any moment where I had any thought of flinching. Um, I have my flaws. In fact, I have significant flaws in my character, of which I'm perfectly aware. Uh, but one thing I could say, and I don't think anybody will dispute, uh, I'm not for sale. Uh, you know, if, even in what I write, if somebody were to come along, like Sheld Sheldon Adelson, and say, I'll give you a million dollars if you change one word in the Holocaust industry, uh, I could say with absolute certainty I wouldn't do it. I, I mean, uh, maybe people don't believe me, and you can test me, anyone who's listening. Offer me a million dollars to change one word. There's no way I would do it. Well, now, when my editor tells me to change a word because I have poor usage, of course I'll change it. But I'm, I'm not for sale. So there was never any, uh, you know, you, you, there are th feelings you have. I remember when I came back after I was denied tenure, um, I called was this up after the Holocaust industry? No, this was after I was in my tenure at the pool. Um, and I came home, I remember I lied down on the bed and I uh, was at the time uh, quite close to Professor Chomsky and his wife Carol, and I, his late wife. And I called up Chomsky and I, I said, do you think I did anything wrong? Which is different than do I regret what I did? It's a question of did I make mistakes for which I should be held accountable? And I remember his answer was, look, Norman, everybody does things wrong. Everyone makes mistakes. Now that, that thing, that would bother me. Self-inflicted wounds which compromise my honor, compromise my dignity. Yes, that would bother me. But the loss of teaching I don't think the price was particularly high. Why did you write the Holocaust industry? Oh, the Holocaust industry, actually, um, I have no recollection ever of having written a book. I don't know why. My mind, I don't remember the process. But I know I wrote it very quickly because I knew a lot of what was being said was not true. I grew up in the, my home. I, my mother used to say, because... She, luck, she liked to quote, with pur purposeful irony, uh, Henry Ford, history is bunk. And, you know, Ford was an anti-Semite, and she was aware of it, but she liked to quote, the, uh, there was an irony there. Because everything, not everything, but so much of what was being said was just complete nonsense. Um, just quickly, for people who don't mm -hmm. know, the basic thesis of the book. Uh, the basic th thesis of the book is very simple, that I don't really talk about the Nazi Holocaust itself. There I rely on the best historians and what they've had to say in the subject. I talk about its uh, 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 exploitation by mostly American Jews for political and also at that time financial gain. Uh, there was this whole shakedown racket of Europe called Holocaust uh, Compensation, uh, which was completely fraudulent, uh, as I think I uh, convincingly demonstrate in the book. Um, and so it's, it's about the exploitation. And it wasn't intended to be a grand 
systematic methodical analysis. The subtitle is Refu Reflections on the Exploitation of Jewish Suffering. Just some of my reflections. And this had a lot to do with Israel using the Holocaust narrative to justify it. Yeah, uh, Israel exploiting the Nazi Holocaust, but also American Jews exploiting the Nazi Holocaust. Now, go, go back to that group you were in at the Lebanese mm -hmm. war um, and not wanting to get into the debate about should Israel exist for oh, no, I wanted to get into debate, but I wanted to get into debate with knowledge. I'm not going to do it because it's an ideological fad. I sat down and I started to read uh, on the subject. Okay, but my, my point is, is that that book, a lot of people thought, a lot mm -hmm. of Jews who didn't agree with you, and a lot mm -hmm. of Jews did agree with you and agreed with the book. Well, not but, a lot agreed with the book, <laughs> not that thing. <laughs> but, well, that's kind of my point, that it was uh -huh. considered inflammatory. Yeah. That you didn't have, even though I think even people that agreed with you thought you didn't have to kind of get, say that the Holocaust was being misused because it was just too sensitive a topic. Well, any, I, any second I, thoughts I, of having oh, written it? No, not at all because uh, as my publisher said, no, the reason that book, unlike all my other books, that book actually succeeded and re reached a wide audience, he said that was just a little bit ahead of the curve. It was already people were sick and tired of the, the, the Nazi Holocaust. Remember the famous line, or infamous line, by uh, Jesse Jackson, it was like 1987 or something, he said, we're sick and tired of the Holocaust, and he got really attacked for it. But people were getting, it, it was obvious that it was being used or put to, to crass purposes. So I was just a little bit ahead of the curve. Nowadays, the book is not even controversial anymore, so everybody refers to a Holocaust industry. Even uh, Avraham Berg, the former speaker of the Israeli Knesset, he wrote a book on the Holocaust about four years ago. And about page six or page eight, he refers to, quote, the Shoah industry, Shoah being the Hebrew word for Holocaust. Uh, the Shoah industry, it's just a commonplace nowadays. So there's nothing particularly controversial anymore uh, in the book. Uh, so I don't have any regrets about it. And it was, for me, it was, um, it was a, a sort of... Uh, my parents at the end, they didn't care how the Holocaust was being used and exploited. History is bunk, who cares? I cared. It did bother me that my parents' suffering was being used for really nefarious purposes uh, to justify the uh, uh, criminal policies against the Palestinians. Uh, that did bother me. Okay, uh, we're going to move kind of a big jump ahead now uh, mm -hmm. because Norman's got a train to catch mm -hmm. um, and he's going to come back again sometime. We can kind of pick it up. So please join us for the next segment of our series on reality asserts itself with Norman Finkelstein. Mm -hmm.